Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Barrett. I'm one of the co-chairs of the uh, clinical track for this meeting. And uh, voice permitting, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Hunt as our plenary speaker for the clinical track. It is um, certainly rare that people do translational medicine these days, and it is even rarer that they do it very well, and, uh, and he does both. Uh, he's a clinician and scientist, an associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and interim chief for the Division of Experimental Medicine in his spare time. Um, he was chair of the ACTG Inflammation Group um, as well. He has a translational program that spans issues in HIV, dealing with immunology, residual inflammation, uh, chronic diseases as they associate with aging, as well as an emerging and exciting program in mucosal immunology that he's helped develop. He's also involved with trials of novel immunotherapies to address the residual inflammation noted in chronic HIV infection despite, uh, despite good treatments, as well as running a cohort of individuals in, uh, for looking at uh, HIV in Uganda as well. He went to Yale University, but then uh, absconded to San Francisco and uh, finished his infectious disease fellowship in 2005, and since then has been incredibly prolific. He has 244 citations, including some rarely heard of journals like Nature, Journal of Infectious Disease, and Clinical Infectious Disease, AIDS, among others. And although Google Scholar doesn't let me check this, and he would never say it, he has an impressive 11,295 citations, many of which are related to patient care and how basic science has contributed to assessing outcomes in HIV. So it is my absolute pleasure to welcome a wonderful clinician scientist to Montreal, to Carr, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Lisa, for such a nice introduction. Boy, you've really set the stage here. I, I hope I can live up to this uh, expectation now. Uh, but um, I'm going to talk about inflammation and aging and treated HIV infection. Uh, and uh, before I start, here's my uh, uh, conflict of interest disclosure. Uh, I've done consulting for Merck, uh, Viv, and Gilead. Um, and to set the stage, um, I'd like to show a slide uh, uh, suggesting that uh, even in the modern treatment era, uh, the life expectancy of people living with HIV uh, is still about 10 years shorter uh, than the general population. These are recent data from the population-based Danish cohort study, um, where they really know the life, ex they really know um, uh, the vital status of all the uh, patients in the country um, uh, and can uh, relate those with HIV to HIV negatives. When they do this, for your average 50-year-old, they, they find this uh, gap of li in life expectancy of about 10 years. Uh, it's true that if you restrict the people who start HIV therapy at the very earliest stages of their disease, at a CD4 count above 500, you start to narrow that life expectancy gap. But it's also true uh, among people who waited until more advanced disease stages, like a CD4 count less than 350, uh, that this life uh, expectancy gap is even wider. Uh, and in the NA Accord study, it may be as high as 20 years in that group. Um, and what's more, um, uh, there are several um, uh, uh, morbidities that are increased uh, uh, in HIV infection uh, um, uh, that, uh, uh, that have also been associated with the inflammatory state. Um, in addition to mortality, there's cardiovascular disease, cancer, venous thromboembolism, type 2 diabetes, COPD, renal disease, bacterial pneumonia, not AIDS-associated uh, pneumonia, but just regular bacterial pneumonia, cognitive dis dysfunction, depression, and, and frailty, a syndrome of multimorbidity that we uh, usually only see uh, in geriatric populations. Uh, so uh, one may ask whether HIV uh, accelerates uh, aging. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, not exactly. Um, and uh, these are also data from the Danish cohort study, uh, which looked at um, uh, several uh, uh, age-related uh, cancers um, uh, in people living with HIV and people without HIV uh, in the country. 
Uh, and the red line um, uh, uh, that you see uh, on the top uh, for infection-related cancers reflects the incidence uh, of infection-related cancers in HIV-infected individuals. The blue line below uh, is the HIV uninfected individuals. And you see, you know, across age groups, you see this increased risk of infection related uh, cancers. You see the same thing in the panel below uh, for smoking related cancers, although <clears throat> the increase is not quite as dramatic. Um, but in, in both situations, if you look at the ratio of um, HIV risk versus HIV negative in purple, that line is declining with advancing age. Um, it's not that HIV is accelerating aging. It's not that the risk is increasing further uh, with increasing age. It's actually declining. <clears throat> and so it's not increased risk. At, it's more of an increased risk at all ages, not accelerated aging that we're seeing. And uh, one other point to make uh, uh, is that it's not all age-related cancers that are increased in treated HIV infection. If you look at very common age-associated malignancies like prostate cancer, breast cancer, and colon cancer, uh, these are not increased at all uh, in the HIV-infected population. Uh, and so uh, there's ages, uh, HIV is increasing the risk of certain complications associated with aging, but not all complications associated with aging. And that's an important point to keep in mind. So, um, we have focused uh, uh, on a role of persistent inflammation and in potentially contributing to this increased risk of multimorbidity that we see in HIV. Um, uh, in the past, many uh, people have focused on lifestyle factors uh, driving some of the increased risk uh, that we see in the HIV-infected population. I'll come back to that concept a little bit later in the, in the talk. Others have focused on uh, the uh, toxicities of the drugs that we use to treat HIV and contributing to these complications. Um, although those toxicities are, are much more modest in the uh, modern treatment era, but many of us are really focused on inflammation contributing to these uh, uh, chronic diseases of aging. And, and we've done so because of an important clue from nature. Um, on the left-hand side of the slide here, uh, you see the Sudi Mangabe monkey. Uh, this is the natural host of the simian immunodeficiency virus, where one of the strains of HIV came from. Uh, it's found in Western Africa, and it's been naturally infected with the SIV virus uh, for thousands and thousands of years. Um, it uh, experiences very high levels of uh, SIV replication in the blood uh, when infected, um, uh, comparable to, if not higher, uh, than we see in HIV-infected people. Uh, yet, it lives a normal lifespan and does not get uh, immunodeficiency in AIDS. But you take the same virus and you put it in a, a different monkey, in this case the rhesus macaque, uh, and when it's infected with SIV, it experiences very high levels of uh, virus replication too, about the same level as we see in SIV, in, in the Sudi Mangabe, but it uh, pro uh, progresses to AIDS and death very, very rapidly. Um, and so the difference between the two monkeys is not the virus. The virus is the same, but rather it's the response of the immune system to the virus that determines how rapidly the monkeys progress. The monkey on the left that does not get sick has very minimal levels of systemic immune activation in the chronic phase of the infection, uh, whereas the monkey on the right experiences massive levels of systemic immune activation. Um, and I'm not just talking about the T cells and the B cells that are supposed to recognize uh, SIV and HIV antigens. I'm talking about even the non-HIV or SIV specific T cells that get activated. Uh, the innate immune system gets activated. Uh, the dendritic cells, uh, monocytes, macrophages, natural killer cells, they all get activated in the context uh, uh, of uh, HIV and SIV. And the more of that you have, the more rapid you, rapidly you progress. That's true in the, in the uh, non-human primate models here. It's also true uh, in HIV-infected people and untreated disease. And many years ago, uh, uh, our own group and others uh, uh, started looking at individuals on treated, uh, 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 treated with antiretroviral therapy and maintaining an undetectable viral load in green. And when we looked at one of these markers of systemic immune activation, uh, the, the frequency of uh, CD38 and HLA-DR uh, uh, positive CD8 T cells or T cell activation, 
uh, we saw this, um, uh, that it, while it declined uh, during suppressive therapy, it failed to normalize uh, compared to HIV uninfected individuals uh, in blue. Uh, and others have looked at uh, soluble markers of inflammation uh, and innate immune activation. Uh, these are data from the Insight Network uh, where they've compared individuals who are suppressed in antiretroviral therapy uh, to those uh, 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 HIV uninfected individuals in the Cardia and MESA cohorts um, who were matched for age and gender and traditional cardiovascular risk factors, and they see significantly increased uh, levels of these uh, inflammatory markers in the blood. For IL-6, it's 150 percent higher uh, in HIV uh, than in HIV uninfected individuals. So what are the clinical consequences of persistent immune activation and inflammation during therapy? Well. These are data uh, also from the Insight Network, uh, <clears throat> where they've linked just a single measurement of these inflammatory or coagulation markers for D-dimer um, uh, to non-AIDS events or death uh, over the next 10 years. They took the control arms of three very large randomized control trials. These were treated and virally suppressed individuals, just followed forward in time and a single measurement of IL-6 uh, predicted disease um, out for a decade. Two things to take away from this slide. One, um, the strength of this association is much stronger uh, than we see in older uh, HIV uninfected individuals. Inflammatory markers like IL-6 and coagulation markers like D-dimer, they predict morbidity and mortality in elderly populations and in people with cardiovascular disease, just not this strongly. And that suggested to many of us uh, that inflammation may be playing a more important role in the context of HIV in dr driving disease risk than it does in the general population. The second thing to take away from the slide is that those curves are continuing to separate over time. Uh, so uh, the risk um, uh, for someone in the top quartile of IL-6 uh, is about 20% uh, uh, of having one of these events uh, at, uh, at 10 years compared to just 5% um, out at 10 years in the lowest quartile, and the curves are continuing to separate, suggesting to us there's likely to be an inflammatory set point within uh, uh, individuals uh, that continues to predict risk over time. Uh, and um, uh, so there may be some individuals who are at very low risk uh, for disease, and, and maintaining a low inflammatory state, and others that maintain a higher inflammatory state. And uh, I, I showed you this slide uh, uh, earlier, but several studies have linked um, uh, this inflammatory state that we've uh, uh, measured to many of the diseases that are known to be increased in the context of treated HIV infection. And so what's driving uh, this inflammatory state during uh, antiretroviral therapy? Well, the, the first place to look is the virus itself. Uh, so uh, HIV, uh, we know we can't uh, uh, eradicate uh, HIV yet, uh, which means um, <clears throat> that HIV continues to leach out of cells um, even after we've achieved a clinically uh, undetectable viral load uh, with uh, modern antiretroviral therapy. And these are data from Sarah Palmer and Frank Valdarelli um, using their single copy assay. That shows that if you use ultra-sensitive techniques, you can still find the virus in plasma. Um, we think that most of this virus uh, uh, it reflects release of virus from infected cells in the absence of ongoing rounds of productive replication. This is an ongoing area of controversy in the field. Um, it's likely that there may be one or two rounds of, um, uh, of replication that may continue uh, uh, in the lymphoid tissues, uh, but most of the virus that we're measuring in the blood uh, does seem to be coming out uh, of, uh, of infected cells in the absence of productive replication. And that's important to note uh, because we currently lack interventions that block HIV expression from cells. All of our drugs work by blocking new rounds of replication, but we can't turn off the tap, if you will, and stop the virus from coming out. Uh, and the virus coming out of cells may be one of the factors that's driving um, immune activation during suppressive therapy. Uh, and where the virus is coming out is also important. Uh, these are uh, data from Tim Shacker's group, um, uh, uh, published uh, uh, just two years ago now. Uh, and this was a, 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 an important study, I think. Um, what he did was he took patients uh, 
uh, who with, uh, had uh, suppressed uh, a viral loads on therapy, and they underwent an analytic treatment interruption. So they stopped uh, uh, ART, uh, and then three times a week they were followed for um, uh, uh, viral loads. Uh, and they were um, identified the minute the, the viral loads started to come back, uh, and they underwent at that point uh, a, a gut biopsy and a lymph node biopsy. And what they found was even when the viral load was very, very low in the peripheral blood, there was tons of virus when they looked in the tissue uh, with this um, uh, in situ hybridization technique called RNA scope, uh, and particularly in the lymph nodes uh, and in the terminal ileum, uh, where there's a lot of inductive lymphoid tissues. Um, uh, there was tons of virus, suggesting that the virus is likely coming out of those sites and just starting to come out into the blood. And the inference from this, I think, is that HIV preferentially releases uh, in the same anatomic location where adaptive immune responses are supposed to be developed. Um, and that's an important thing to keep in mind when we get to uh, later in the talk and when we pair this uh, to clinical observations. <coughs> And while it's true that HIV can establish myeloid reservoirs and other tissues, uh, so infected macrophages in the brain, liver, and fat, uh, this remains controversial whether this is a persistent uh, uh, reservoir during antiretroviral therapy, but certainly HIV can infect those cells. Um, when it does, it does so only at later stages of disease. Um, the inductive lymphoid tissues, the infected T cells in the lymph nodes and in the terminal ileum, those are established in the first week uh, of infection. Um, another thing that's important to keep in mind as we move along. What about other viruses? Uh, so HIV itself, we think, may be driving uh, 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 the inflammatory state. Uh, but we've also thought about cytomegalovirus, or CMV. Uh, it's a very common co-infection in the, in the context of HIV. Well over 90% uh, of individuals with HIV are CMV seropositive. Um, and we thought that CMV uh, might be contributing uh, to the inflammatory state um, uh, uh, in the context of uh, uh, treated HIV infection. So we did a randomized controlled trial several years ago of valgancyclovir, a potent CMV drug, uh, in individuals with uh, suboptimal CD4 recovery during antiretroviral therapy. And we found uh, uh, that those getting valgancyclovir had a significant reduction uh, in T cell activation, uh, a, a reduction that persisted for at least four weeks uh, after we stopped the study drug. Um, and uh, uh, while uh, valgancyclovir uh, can uh, suppress other herpes viruses uh, as well. Uh, uh, Sarah and Walmsley's group is uh, here at the meeting, um, uh, did uh, a, a trial of valacyclovir in treated HIV infection several years ago, uh, showing that it uh, uh, failed uh, uh, to decrease uh, um, uh, immune activation. Uh, and that drug uh, has potent activity against other herpes viruses, herpes simplex virus one and two, the very minimal uh, uh, activity against CMV at the dosage uh, used. So we think um, uh, the inference from both studies here is probably that uh, the, 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 the beneficial effect on immune activation we saw is likely uh, uh, based on uh, suppressing CMV. So um, CMV serostatus also seems to predict non-AIDS events. Um, so, um, and in particular, uh, cardiovascular complications. These are data uh, from the uh, Icona cohort in Italy um, where they compared uh, individuals, uh, largely treated individuals um, uh, with antiretroviral therapy, uh, those with, uh, who were CMV seropositive versus negative. Not much of a difference in terms of uh, AIDS-related uh, complications. Um, uh, but uh, for non-AIDS events, they saw significantly higher risk of these uh, complications in people who were CMV seropositive, and the strongest association was with cardiovascular disease, about a 2.3-fold increased risk. And that's important to note because CMV replicates in vascular endothelium uh, and can contribute to transplant vasculopathy in another setting uh, where you have profound uh, Im immunosuppression. Uh, so there's a, a mechanistic basis to think that CMV might be contributing to cardiovascular complications. This is also likely to play more of an important role in individuals with the low CD4 T cell nadir, uh, as these individuals um, uh, have uh, even more dramatic um, uh, adaptive immune defects. 
What about other indirect uh, uh, mechanisms by which uh, uh, HIV may uh, cause inflammation? Well, there's the so-called leaky gut syndrome or microbial translocation that was described now a decade ago uh, by uh, Jason Brenchley and Danny Duick. Um, and what's pictured here on the uh, top of the slide <coughs> is a normal um, uh, a gut uh, epithelial border. Uh, that long pink ribbon um, is the brick wall that separates uh, uh, the, the, the inside of the gut uh, where you have lots of um, uh, bacterial products. Uh, those blue risotto-like particles uh, are bacteria. Uh, sorry for the gross analogy. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, and, and that brick wall is uh, preventing those bacteria from getting into um, uh, the circulation. And what's more, behind that brick wall, you have a potent um, uh, uh, inductive uh, 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 immune system, pyres, patches, and, and the mesenteric lymph nodes, uh, which can surveil against invading pathogens. Uh, but in the very earliest stages of HIV infection, really the first week, uh, you have profound loss of mucosal immunity. Um, even when the CD4 count may be normal in the peripheral blood, uh, there's profound depletion of CD4 T cells and Th17 cells um, uh, in the lining of the gut. Um, and uh, Th17 cells in particular, and, and as well as Th22 cells, uh, have very important functions in helping man maintain gut uh, epithelial barrier integrity. And, and so you don't just have the loss of CD4 cells, you also have a disrupted gut epithelial border. Um, uh, apoptosis of gut epithelial cells as well as loss of tight junctions uh, between those epithelial cells. So bacteria can now get through into systemic circulation and cause immune activation. So microbial translocation, uh, in fact, persists even after uh, antiretroviral therapy. Uh, and in particular, uh, those who started ART at very advanced disease stages uh, at a low nadir CD4 count and are experiencing poor CD4 recovery. And this is a study we did uh, 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 with uh, Ma Samsuk uh, in San Francisco. He's a gastroenterologist uh, interested in this problem in the context of HIV. Uh, and in working with Jake Estes uh, from the NIH, we uh, uh, did a, um, a myeloperoxidase stain for uh, a neutrophil infiltration. And that's the brown stain that you see in these gut biopsies. So you see on the left, uh, the HIV uninfected individual has very little neutrophil in infiltration in their gut. Um, but in HIV, uh, even in people with, uh, uh, who have restored relatively normal CD4 counts above 500 in the middle, uh, you see uh, uh, this uh, brown staining neutrophil response. Uh, that's a neutrophil response uh, to invading uh, pathogens in a leaky gut barrier. Um, and, uh, and you see the situation is much, much worse uh, in individuals with low CD4 counts despite uh, therapy, much more neutrophil uh, uh, infiltration. And so several groups have also uh, characterized persistent uh, microbial translocation despite therapy uh, using soluble markers as well in the plasma. And so all this has led to the current paradigm where we think that HIV is activating the innate immune system either directly uh, through toll-like receptors and its accessory uh, viral proteins um, or possibly via microbial translocation, uh, an, an indirect mechanism. And then further indirect mechanisms via immunodeficiency leading to viral reactivation, things like CMV or inadequate control of CMV that may also contribute to innate immune activation. And this has several downstream consequences. Uh, inflammatory cytokine secretion, uh, which may drive several inflammation-related diseases like osteoporosis, atherosclerosis, type 2 diabetes. Uh, but also inflammation within the inductive lymphoid tissues uh, may lead to increased T cell turnover and lymphoid fibrosis compromising um, uh, the competence of, of the adaptive immune system, uh, potentially leading to an increased risk of malignancies and, and infections. And in work I didn't have time to show, um, this innate immune activation has also been linked by Michael Letterman and others uh, to increased tissue factor expression on monocytes. Um, uh, which may uh, contribute to the thrombotic uh, events that we see in HIV. And so where would we want to intervene in all these immunologic mechanisms? We can intervene at the root causes uh, of the inflammatory state, which I think we should uh, uh, still be doing. Um, 
uh, but are there particular inflammatory pathways that are uh, more uh, potently associated with uh, clinical endpoints? And so we've done this um, recently, and uh, we did a nested case control uh, study within the study of the ocular complications of AIDS or, or SOCA. Um, uh, we chose this cohort because uh, it was a very advanced cohort uh, of individuals who started ART uh, at a very low nadir CD4 count, a median nadir of 30. Uh, so half of the people had a lower nadir CD4 count than that. Um, and they were following forward in time uh, with um, uh, not just plasma storage, but also uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cell storage. So we could look at both plasma and cellular markers as predictors uh, of mortality. Uh, and when we did that, um, when we compared those who died uh, versus those who were followed for the same period of time but remained alive, um, we found several striking associations. Uh, several markers of microbial translocation uh, were uh, strongly associated uh, with uh, an increased uh, risk of mortality. Uh, several inflammatory and coagulation markers were also uh, associated with uh, increased uh, uh, mortality. In particular, uh, uh, the inflammatory marker IL-6, 70-fold uh, increased risk of death uh, for those in the top quartile versus the lowest quartile. That's an extraordinarily strong uh, association. Uh, again, further suggesting that the inflammatory state is likely a key um, a contributor to disease risk. But note uh, here at the bottom uh, that uh, markers of T-cell senescence, um, uh, 28 negative, uh, 57 positive CD8 T-cells, uh, which predict mortality in elderly HIV uninfected populations, uh, don't predict uh, disease at all here in HIV. In fact, the association seems to be going uh, in the opposite direction. Um, and uh, this uh, really uh, interested us because the dogma at the time had been uh, that HIV accelerates immunosenescence. It's just like aging. Uh, but as I've tried to point out at several points during the talk here, HIV is not exactly the same thing uh, as accelerated aging. There are only certain diseases that are increased, and the immunologic mechanisms may actually be distinct uh, from those that we see in aging. And to walk you through that, um, this is, um, we focused, we tried to drill down on this issue um, and, and characterize the CD8 T cell phenotypes uh, that predict disease and aging versus uh, HIV. Uh, and this schematic depicts what we think happens uh, in, in aging and in, in the context of other infections like cytomegalovirus, uh, where you have a, a central memory CD8 T cell on the far left that gets stimulated by antigen and undergoes uh, multiple rounds of proliferation and terminal differentiation. Uh, and as it uh, moves further to the right and you get more differentiated cells, multiple rounds of proliferation, the telomeres shorten in those cells um, uh, and CD57 starts to be expressed on the cell surface. Um, but these effector uh, CD8 T cells that are CD28 negative um, uh, uh, tend to be enriched uh, in, in CMV and in aging. And that, the more of that you have, uh, the higher your risk of death in that setting. In HIV, however, it's a very different scenario. Uh, so we, we, we don't see many of those cells that are terminally differentiated at the end. Um, we see rather enrichment uh, for cells, effector cells, so these 28 negative CD8 T cells, but far fewer of them undergo multiple rounds of proliferation and, and, and maturation, um, uh, and they get sort of stuck in the middle, if you will. Uh, and it's this process of getting stuck in the middle that seems to predict mortality in our hands. If we go back to that same um, uh, cohort study, the SOCA uh, study, uh, it's low, not high, uh, CD57 uh, uh, frequencies of uh, 28 negative CD8 T cells that predict mortality. Uh, so so uh, uh, there's a five-fold increased risk uh, of mortality in those with the lowest CD57 expression on effector CD8 T cells. So the extent you're getting stuck uh, uh, and not uh, uh, terminally differentiating um, uh, seems to predict mortality in HIV, and that's the exact opposite of what we see in aging. Rather, in aging, it's uh, the terminal differentiation of the cells that seems to predict risk. <clears throat> so can early ART initiation prevent the inflammatory state and age-associated morbidity? 
So, well, that's um, uh, one thing that Natanya sandler Ute and uh, uh, Irini Soretti uh, uh, addressed very recently uh, in the RV254 uh, study uh, done in Thailand. Um, and, and they were able to show that uh, when you identify people in the very first few weeks of their HIV infection, so in the very acute stages of HIV infection and put them on antiretroviral therapy, these markers of innate immune activation, uh, they do go down, and they go down to levels that are lower uh, than we see in, in patients who start therapy in chronic HIV infection. So there clearly is uh, uh, an inflammatory, a benefit on the inflammatory state if you start uh, HIV uh, uh, therapy at very early stages. But it doesn't normalize when compared to HIV uninfected uh, individuals, um, uh, the dotted line there at the bottom. Uh, and so things get better, but they don't totally normalize. Now, how does this translate to clinical outcomes? Well, we got recent um, uh, uh, data from uh, two large clinical trials, uh, uh, which, which, which inform uh, the risk uh, uh, of, uh, of disease uh, uh, with delaying antiretroviral therapy. Uh, one is the Temprano study done uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, uh, and in this study, uh, a subset of uh, these individuals uh, uh, were identified with CD4 counts above 500, and they were um, randomized to either uh, starting ART immediately uh, or delaying until WHO criteria uh, said it was appropriate to start. Um, and, uh, and, and what everyone recalls from this study is that um, uh, there was a clear benefit uh, of, um, uh, on morbidity and mortality uh, with uh, early ART initiation. There was also a profound benefit of isoniazid uh, preventative therapy for TB. Uh, that's what the IPT stands for. Uh, but if you look uh, out here at the end, even in those groups that um, uh, started ART very early at a high CD4 count, there was still a profoundly high risk uh, of morbidity and mortality, mostly from tuberculosis, uh, uh, five to seven percent uh, uh, at 30 uh, months. Um, uh, that's much, much higher than the incidence of tuberculosis in the general population. Um, and this, I think, suggests to us that there may still be some adaptive immune defects uh, that are continuing uh, 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 to uh, uh, confer risk of uh, infectious complications, even in patients uh, who start ART at the very earliest stages. And in fact, at CROI uh, earlier uh, this year, uh, we heard uh, a secondary analysis from this study suggesting that isoniazid used uh, even in patients starting at a high T cell count seems to reduce mortality. Uh, so there's clearly a, a, a profound um, uh, 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 immunologic defect that's even persisting in patients um, uh, who, uh, who start ther therapy early. Uh, a similar inference came from the START study, where there was a reduced per but persistently high risk of infectious complications and cancer uh, in those uh, individuals who started um, uh, uh, immediate ART. Everyone recalls the profound reduction in AIDS events and also non-AIDS events uh, in that study. But if you look at the specific events that were most profoundly reduced uh, by immediate ART, uh, it was mostly infectious complications and cancer. Um, and what's more, uh, even though those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, risks were profoundly reduced uh, by early ART, there was still a 1% risk of AIDS uh, at five years in patients who started ART at a high T cell count, above 500. So the risk is reduced, but it does not normalize. But what about non-infectious morbidities? Well, if you look in the START study, um, uh, there was no effect, uh, really, uh, on uh, cardiovascular complications observed. There's maybe a slight trend uh, towards a, a decline, but nowhere near the effect we observed with infectious complications and cancer. There's also been several sub-studies looking at neurologic complications, looking at bone complications, uh, uh, looking at uh, pulmonary complications and surrogate markers of cardiovascular disease. None of those sub-studies showed a benefit uh, of early ART or immediate ART initiation and start um, 
And this is in um, uh, stark contrast uh, to what was observed a decade earlier in the SMART study on the left-hand side uh, of the graph here. Uh, cardiovascular complications in that study uh, were much higher in individuals who interrupted uh, therapy uh, versus continued on stable uh, uh, therapy. And so the, the difference between these two studies, uh, there are several potential reasons why we may have observed uh, a difference. Uh, but uh, we think that one of the key factors uh, is uh, that the individuals in SMART had much lower nadir CD4 counts. Both groups, even the immediate uh, ART arm, had a much higher uh, risk of cardiovascular disease already. Um, and so this is really interesting to us, um, uh, that uh, some uh, complications we think may be low nadir CD4 count diseases. That uh, the increased risk of several um, uh, morbidities associated with aging that we see in HIV, uh, many of them may be low nadir diseases, not really observed in individuals uh, who start ART uh, at really high CD4 counts. And that's led to, uh, to a new theoretical model uh, that we've recently proposed, uh, whereby uh, the separate drivers of, of immune activation during suppressive ART may have actually distinct um, uh, uh, consequences in terms of end organ disease manifestations and related to the CD4 nadir. Uh, so HIV reservoirs in lymphoid tissues. Um, I told you earlier that HIV establishes those reservoirs in the first week of the infection. Uh, and, and so that reservoir is there, leaching out virus in the lymph nodes uh, and the very anatomic compartments where we develop uh, adaptive immune responses. Uh, so it's very plausible that HIV itself um, uh, may be a key a contributor to adaptive immune defects uh, and risk of infectious uh, and complications and cancer. Microbial translocation, while it is also started very early on uh, during uh, HIV infection, the degree to which it's irreversible with antiretroviral therapy is much, much greater uh, with more advanced uh, disease progression. Uh, and so this uh, tends to be more of a, of a low uh, CD4 nadir type phenomenon. Uh, and since uh, it, it, it showers uh, uh, microbial products throughout the circulation, may plausibly contribute to many uh, uh, morbidities. HIV and myeloid cells, to the extent uh, that these uh, remain a persistent reservoir uh, during treated HIV infection, uh, may distribute the anatomic source of the inflammatory state to many different tissues besides just the inductive lymphoid tissues, contributing to diseases in very different sites, including the CNS, uh, the liver, and, um, and the fat. Uh, and then lastly, CMV, as I told you, uh, it may, as, it, as it may be a consequence of immunodeficiency uh, and preferentially replicates in the vasculature, uh, may be a, a key predictor of vascular disease. So this is the, uh, our new hypothesis uh, for how the various drivers of immune activation may be uh, contributing to disease. And it's not a, a uniform inflammatory state driving all diseases, uh, but rather uh, discrete uh, uh, pathways. So what can we do now? Are there any interventions to reverse uh, immune activation during suppressive antiretroviral therapy? Well, in the clinic, um, we don't have any drugs uh, right now that are approved uh, uh, to do this, um, uh, but we do need to note that lifestyle factors are really important. Um, uh, several lifestyle factors have been associated with immune activation. Of course, we don't need another study to tell us that smoking uh, uh, is bad for you. But smoking, you may not know, also increases monocyte activation and many of the same inflammatory pathways that are increased uh, in HIV and predict risk. Um, hazardous alcohol use also increases microbial translocation and some of the same biomarkers that predict mortality in HIV. Uh, methamphetamine use, uh, Marta Massanello is here, uh, published a study uh, a few uh, years ago suggesting that methamphetamine increases immune activation and decreases T cell function. Uh, so it may contribute to some of those adaptive uh, immune defects uh, uh, that we see. Obesity is associated with increased inflammation uh, and moderate exercise has been shown to decrease inflammation in several pilot uh, uh, studies. So. Uh, so there are many reasons uh, uh, to pursue a healthy diet, to quit smoking, uh, 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 to, to abstain from drugs, uh, 
Uh, all these things can have very positive effects, uh, uh, not just on your overall health, uh, but also on the inflammatory state that we think may be driving disease. The drugs that are furthest along are the statins, um, uh, cholesterol medicines that have anti-inflammatory properties have been studied in several pilot uh, uh, randomized controlled trials. And this one from uh, Grace McComsey's group uh, showing that soluble CD14, this marker of monocyte activation, declines um, uh, significantly uh, with the rosuvastatin uh, and uh, others. Uh, uh, Janet Lowe and uh, Steve Grinspoon's group um, uh, showed that atorvastatin induced plaque regression uh, uh, in uh, the aorta um, uh, in individuals uh, with HIV. Uh, so uh, uh, these and many other um, uh, pilot studies uh, uh, have uh, put forward uh, a large clinical endpoint trial, which is now over halfway enrolled, uh, enrolling internationally. Uh, a, a trial of patavastatin to see whether it uh, reduces cardiovascular complications, clinical events um, in individuals who don't otherwise meet clinical indications for statin therapy. Really important from this study will be to find out whether it not just reduces cardiovascular complications, but also cancer, infectious complications, and many of the other um, inflammation-associated morbidities um, uh, we're concerned about. And then the whole next round of uh, interventions that we're pursuing uh, are, you know, I like to think of or uh, organize uh, by uh, a tree analogy. Um, and by that, I mean, I think the leaves of a tree uh, are like the end organ diseases, the many different end organ diseases that are increased in HIV uh, that we want to um, uh, decrease. Uh, the roots uh, are the uh, various uh, drivers of the inflammatory state, including HIV reservoirs, CMV, uh, microbial translocation. Uh, and the branches are may maybe some of those uh, downstream pathways, IL-6, D-dimer, lymphoid fibrosis, uh, many others uh, that may be contributing to these unique um, uh, end organ complications. Um, uh, but can we find the tree trunk? Uh, and many of us are focused uh, on some of these uh, early uh, innate pathways, which may lead to several of these downstream uh, inflammatory pathways that are also driven uh, by several of the root drivers. Um, uh, so instead of taking you know, three different drugs for each of the different root drivers of the inflammatory state, in, in addition to your antiretroviral therapy, you know, perhaps we can identify inhibitors of uh, some of these innate pathways that are driven by all three uh, that might uh, uh, confer decreased risk over time. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, close and summarize that despite optimal therapy, HIV shortens life expectancy and may increase many age-related morbidities. Uh, but some of those morbidities may be low CD4 innate or diseases, and not all age-related um, uh, morbidities are increased in HIV. Uh, immune activation and inflammation persist despite therapy and may predict these morbidities. And the adaptive immune defects caused by HIV may actually persist despite ART. And these may be distinct uh, from the aging-related uh, defects uh, uh, that, um, uh, uh, that we know of. And uh, statins uh, and targeting the root causes of the inflammatory state uh, and the tree trunk, if you will, uh, may hold promise uh, and are in various stages of clinical development now. And then lastly, uh, while we wait for new interventions, lifestyle inter interventions are important. Smoking cessation and exercise are really important to recommend uh, uh, to uh, uh, HIV-infected individuals uh, to help improve health. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll stop by acknowledging all our funders uh, and uh, collaborators who contributed to this work, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for this f fantastic uh, presentation and so nice uh, slide. You, you focus everything on, on CD4. Can you give some uh, vision about the ratio CD4, CD8, and maybe CD8 elevation uh, on its own uh, during treated infection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a great, great question. So the CD4 to CD8 ratio, uh, which is often available in the clinic, um, is uh, also uh, uh, strongly predictive of uh, disease outcomes, morbidity and mortality in, in treated HIV infection. Um, it's related to the inflammatory state. Um, so with immune activation, you get this dramatic expansion of um, 
and CDAT cells. They're not quite the terminally differentiated ones, the right type of uh, CDAs, um, uh, and they may be contributing to pathology or it could just be a marker uh, of the underlying inflammatory state. It's strongly related to things like T cell activation, uh, also uh, uh, indolamine 2,3-dioxygenase, uh, uh, you know, uh, an innate pathway I know you're interested in specifically uh, yeah. uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that seems to predict uh, disease, particularly in resource-limited settings, uh, uh, as we've seen in our Ugandan cohort. Um, uh, but uh, but the CD4 to CD8 ratio may be a useful uh, uh, biomarker in the clinic uh, uh, for as we get new interventions to apply, it may be good for risk stratification. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, Ron Rosenest, community person, uh, who frequently uh, talks to community about um, various aspects of HIV and aging. And one of the most um, challenging um, statements is really around life expectancy. And um, I, mean, I noted what you said this morning about uh, the gaps that you showed with the Danish cohort. Um, there's other information that really suggests um, that there's a lot of complexity there and that the gap narrows depending on the amount or number of, you know, comorbidities or degree of multimorbidity. Um, so uh, some of the other information I've seen suggests that at the end of the day, if you control for all those factors uh, and you have a very limited number of risks that we're looking more at uh, around five years uh, in terms of a gap, can you just sort of speak again to some of the complexities there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so in the Danish cohort study, which I showed you, when they controlled for uh, uh, morbidities, um, it was a nine-year gap. Um, uh, there's the Kaiser uh, uh, cohort uh, study uh, um, uh, in the United States uh, that suggested if you restrict to people who started a CD4 count above 500, who don't smoke, don't have hepatitis C or hepatitis B, uh, that you, and uh, non-injection drug users, uh, you, you get down to uh, about five years, uh, as you say. One of the issues with, um, uh, so, so that's definitely true. Um, the more you get rid of all the morbidities um, uh, and the earlier you start uh, ART, the narrower the gap is. Um, <clears throat> but uh, at, the, at, at the same time, uh, uh, the vast majority of people living with HIV in the world um, have still started ART at a much lower CD4 count, and in most cases far below 350, uh, when we know that from the NA Accord study, the gap is much larger um, uh, in that group, probably around 20 years uh, they've seen uh, between people starting above 500 and below 350. Uh, and so I think while, uh, while, it's, uh, while those life expectancy data are reason to really recommend that people get on treatment, uh, get diagnosed and into care and on treatment as early as possible um, uh, and avoid uh, uh, you know, uh, lifestyle factors that contribute to risk, um, I think that uh, uh, we're still left with a, a large population of individuals who has high risk that we need to do something for. So, so that's how I put it together. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. I don't know if okay. there is time for one. S sorry, I think sure. to keep things on time this early in the day, we're going to have to end. But okay. Dr. Hunt okay. gets around to answer questions. And uh, thank you very much. You have a gift. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs>